Okay, so what do you do when the dream that's inside of you doesn't match the reality that's in front of you? Well, we're gonna be talking about that in this video, and we're gonna be specifically talking about breaking the 200 barrier in church growth, coming up. <laughs> Hey, what's up, y'all? If we are meeting for the first time, my name is Chris Abbott, but all my friends just call me Abbo. And on this channel, we are talking about practical ways to use church growth and social media in order to reach people far from God and grow our church. So what I specifically want to do in this video, I'm going to switch it up and do something a little bit different. I recently read an article from Carrie Newhoff that was so good that I'm basically just going to share the six keys from that article that Carrie wrote in this video right here, right? So I kind of put my own twist on it. I'm going to share some of my own thoughts. But he has a phenomenal article called Six Keys to Breaking the 200, 400, and 800 Growth Barriers in Your Church. So you can check that out on his blog, but we're going to be specifically breaking down some of those keys and talking about how we can apply those to our church. So let's dive in. All right, number one is push down decision making, right? So I would call this bottleneck decision making. And I've seen this in my church. I'm sure you've seen this in your church. I've seen this in organizations. It's what happens is when we first start something, especially if you planted the church, right? Or if you've been at the church for a long time, we first start something and basically everything goes through us, right? Like we have to make every decision. We have to design every flyer. We have to design every t-shirt, right? We're basically doing every single thing. And so we control the look and the feel of everything. But what happens is when you start to grow to a certain point, in order to continue growing, you have to be able to raise up a leadership team and empower your leaders to make decisions, right? And this sounds easy, but it's actually really difficult, right? Like, I don't know about you guys. I've had trouble with this. Like, as I did this, I remember when I first became a youth pastor, right? At first, it was me just like working like a dog to try to get the word out. And it worked. Like, we doubled the youth group in about 90 days, right? So we went from 65 kids to 130 in the first three months, right? But what happened is we started hitting that 130, 140, 150 mark. Right, I'm trying to push through to break through 200 kids, but all of a sudden there were more kids than I could personally minister to every single Sunday. I couldn't allow myself to be the bottleneck every single time. Right, And so what I had to do is I actually had to raise up leaders and empower them to be able to continue to grow and be able to reach more kids. And that sounds easy, right? And eventually I figured it out, but it took me a while, right? It wasn't easy for me to just start saying, oh, perfect, take everything that I created here and then go drive it like you stole it. I'm like, man, what if they burn it down? What if they make the wrong decision? What if they do something that puts us in a weird position legally, right? Like when I was in youth ministry growing up, we used to do like slip and slides, like down a hill into like a patch of rocks and we'd like slice our arms open and stuff like that, right? Right? And like people would need stitches, but we just pray over it and then go again. I freak out over that now that I'm like a grown up, right? I'm like, we can't do that kind of stuff. We had a concert on the roof one time and had like 200 kids show up and so did the cops, right? Like that was insane. Like I think about that kind of stuff now and I'm like, gosh, what were we thinking, right? So when you put the decision-making process in your leader's hands, it can be a little bit scary. But if you've trained them right, if they're people that you trust, right, this is something that's gonna help you be able to grow your church and break through the 200 barrier. In fact, there's something in social psychology called Dunbar number, right? It says that we can only effectively manage about 150 social connections and anything over that number, right? And we're going to start to mismanage some of those relationships and it's always going to kind of come back down to 150. So in church growth, this is why so many churches hit that 130, 140, 150 number, right? You might even be tipping the scales at 170, 180, 190, right? You're almost bumping 200, but you can't break through. It's because that's the max amount of relationships that you can effectively handle. And so what you have to do is now you have to switch into the the role of a coach. So if you have four leaders on your team now and each of them can successfully manage 150 relationships, now your capacity is 600, right? But at the same time, as you continue, right, as you're breaking through 400, 500, 600, you're gonna have to continue to level up as a leader and continue to raise up next generation leaders and you have to be able to trust them with the decision-making power. So a great rule to follow is that if you have a leader over an area, they are the decision maker for that area, right? They can come to you and ask your opinion. They can talk to some of the other leaders, right, that are trusted and get their opinion, but ultimately they are the decision maker. The only exceptions that you may want to think through if you are giving the sole decision making power to your leaders, right, are things like if one of their decisions is actually going to take the budget past what you currently have budgeted, either for their area or for the church, right, then that might be a decision that they have to run through you and that you have to help them as the leader to figure out. Or if the decision that they're making is going to affect other areas of ministry, right, both positively or negatively, that needs to be a decision that runs through you as the leader as well. And finally, if it impacts or changes the mission or the core values of your church, again, that's something that needs to be run through you. But everything else, what to spend the money on, whether or not
not they should do an event or how they're going to run those ministry. Those decisions need to be entrusted with your leaders. It's not an easy transition to make, but once you do, everything is gonna go much, much smoother. It's amazing how much you can get done when you let others lead. All right, number two, a willingness to let others take the credit. Now, when I, when I first read this on Carrie's blog, I'm telling you, this is the one that for me just made me go like, Ugh! like it's really, really hard for me to let other people take credit, especially for my ideas, right? Like in ministry, this has always been tough for me. I remember my pastor one time, we'd just done a new song that I had written with one of the other worship leaders and we did it on Sunday and pastor got up and just said, man, wasn't that an incredible song? Man, Josh wrote that song this week and we've done it here, man, he's doing such a great job. And I just thought, what about Abbo? Like, hey, like I wrote that song with Josh. Like I came up with the melody line. I wrote the chorus. Like I wrote the bridge. Like, you know, and I was just like, like it hurt on the inside. Right? And I literally just had to be like, man, it doesn't matter. Right? Like, man, a, a willingness to let others take the credit. Man, Josh crushed it on that song. Right? Like, man, we teamed up on this thing. And that's one of the things that in order to break the 200 growth barrier, you're going to have to get used to is just letting other people take the credit. In fact, one of the things I learned in youth ministry early on is that a good idea from a team teenager was better than a great idea from me or one of the other leaders. And so oftentimes we would go with an idea that I would think was actually inferior to some of the other ideas that I had, but it was because we wanted to give that credit. We wanted him to feel empowered and to know that he was making a difference. And you should see the look on a teenager's face when they come up with an idea for a new sermon series. And then you go out and you actually execute that sermon series and you bring them in to do some of the preaching with you, kind of do some tag team preaching. We did that before on multiple occasions. And the look of pride and the ownership that they take of the ministry at that point, right? That's priceless. And so giving them and a willingness to let them take the credit, even if it's just a good idea and it's not as good as the great idea I have, it's much better to let other people take the credit and to go with a good idea from someone in your church. So whether it's a desire to control everything or it's just insecurity, we have to be willing to let others take the credit. And Pastor Kerry actually has uh, a great quote that I actually want to uh, read to you guys that I think is really, really important uh, on this point. Okay, so he says that the more you let others lead in the organization, the more you'll struggle with your own role, right? But ironically, doing less and empowering your team doesn't make you less valuable to the organization. It actually makes you more valuable, right? So I think it's really important to understand that we need to empower our leaders and let other people take the credit. It doesn't make us less valuable, but this is actually going to help our people. All right, so before I get to my last couple of points, I wanna hear from you, right? So put it in the comment below. Are there some keys that you think that we're missing in this video? Are there some things that you've seen as you broke the 200 barrier? Or or are there some things that you're struggling with as you're currently trying to break through that 200 barrier? So I wanna hear from you, put it in the comments below. Number three, scalable pastoral care. Right? And this is something that I think a lot of churches really wrestle with because we become the primary caregiver as uh, the pastor, right? So we do all of the marriages and we do all the funerals and we do all the hospital visits and we do all of the in-home visits and we're you know talking to people whenever there's drama at the church and somebody doesn't like the set list or they don't like the new worship that we're doing, right? And we have to handle those. And then we got to answer emails and we've got all these different things that we have to do in addition to actually like staying on mission and also creating a message for Sunday morning. So what happens is it can eat up all of our time. And if you're not careful, it'll do exactly that, right? A lot of pastors suffer from burnout because they become workaholics in order to just run on the hamster wheel trying to keep up with everything. The other thing that a lot of people don't talk about is when you're doing that much, even if you want to grow your church and maybe your church is at 50, 80, 100, 150, 200 plus, but no matter where you're at on that spectrum, when you are running that hard and it feels like you're on the hamster wheel and the only answer is to run harder, work more and work longer hours, what happens is you begin to associate increase with pain. So no matter how much you actually want to reach new people for Jesus, attract new visitors and grow your church, your subconscious actually won't let you because you believe that if you doubled your church, you would double the amount of time you have to work, you double the amount of pain, double the amount of hospital visits and marriages and funerals and everything that you're doing. So you have to have scalable pastoral care if you want to be able to grow your church. You can't be the primary caregiver. So that's where systems are key. And most churches use small groups for this, right? So one of the best ways to create scalable pastoral care is if you have a small group ministry, then it's actually the small group who does the hospital visit. Or it's the small group who's there when someone uh, has a close family member who passes away 
away and they need to organize a meal train and bring dinners every single night, right? Like you can't always do that as the pastor, but with small groups and now building a thriving small group ministry, now that small group can serve as the pastoral care. And now you can scale your church to the moon because you don't have to do all of the caregiving yourself. You don't have to do all the pastoral care. Now all of that falls on the people themselves and it's actually empowering them. And it's actually a lot more powerful and effective. If your pastoral care doesn't scale, then your mission won't either. Number four, governing boards that focus on oversight, not micromanagement. Okay, so if you have boards or committees that are constantly micromanaging things, then your church will stay small forever. Anyone that has experienced this knows exactly what I'm talking about, right? We have to let leaders lead. And when you constantly have like a board or some type of a committee that you have to run every single decision by and they're micromanaging everything, you can never actually grow. So as your church scales beyond 200, you need to find godly leaders who understand how large organizations are run. Board members need to be comfortable with larger budgets and larger attendance and a larger mission and they need to understand the relationship between those. Not everyone has a gifting for this so it's important to choose the right people obviously to pray through this and to choose wisely because Carrie says that churches that end up with a micromanaging board will never be able to scale effectively and you'll definitely never be able to break through the 800 barrier. All right number five an outward focused vision. Too many churches are focused on themselves and keeping their members happy and they're not focusing on the people outside their church, right? So you have to have an outward focused church if you are going to attract new visitors and be able to grow your church past the 200 barrier. And this is tough, right? It's not that people are selfish and hate new people, right? But people get comfortable. It's funny how territorial people can be about where they sit in church. There's nothing like walking in and looking and be like, there's somebody in my seat. In fact, if you've been in ministry for more than five minutes, you've probably had this conversation with somebody in the church, right? They're frustrated because people are sitting in their seat, right? There's no assigned seats in church and we all know that. But when you're used to sitting in the same place every single Sunday, right? For sometimes years on end and somebody's sitting in that place, you feel like a fish out of water sitting anywhere else. And that's what happens when new people start coming into the church, right? It starts changing the way that we've always done things. Maybe the music changes or maybe the amount of people in the sanctuary is changing or maybe there's new small groups or maybe we're starting to make changes inside of the ministry to be able to facilitate more people. And change is uncomfortable, right? That's it's universal. Change is uncomfortable for everybody. In fact, our brains are actually hardwired to reject change. This is something that actually helps us survive. And so in order to focus on new people and have that outward focus, people have to change. And this is something that's going to be uncomfortable for a lot of people. And in fact, not everyone is going to be able to make the change with you. So it's important to have an outward focused vision. A church that is focused on itself ultimately loses its potential to reach people outside the church to get new visitors and to fulfill their mission. And finally, number six, a bias towards what is possible. And again, I think this is something that is really, really easy to fall into, right? Because if you've never broken the 200 barrier before, it might seem really, really hard or even impossible to break the 200 barrier, right? And again, it's because your role has to change, right? According to Dunbar's number, understanding that we can only successfully manage about 150 social interactions, now we have to empower our team. Our role has to shift. You go from being a lone wolf to all of a sudden you have to kind of shift into more of a coach role, right? Like you have to actually coach up a team. My brother-in-law, created one of the largest middle school ministries in the entire country several years ago, right? And he literally started from scratch. And one of the best things that he did, and I watched him do it through the years, is he literally started from scratch with the leaders, right? He didn't go out there and start like doing marketing or come up with these incredible events that were going to pull in middle school kids. He started with the leaders. And what he did was he just cast a little bit of vision. He just started going out to some of the young people who are, you know, 20s and 30s and started talking and just say, hey, will you pray about becoming a middle school leader? I don't know about you guys, but when I was in middle school, that was the first time I was ever offered drugs, right? It was the first time that a girl actually like wanted to have sex with me. It was the first time that I was offered alcohol. It was the first time I went to a party, uh, you know, that had drugs and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And he just said, man, I don't know about you, but that was such a pivotal time in my life, man. And I believe that we have to change that for these people and we have to be able to help middle school kids navigate that man would you just be willing to just pray about maybe you know being a leader and so that simple approach by casting a lot of vision what happened is people bought into him as the leader then they bought into the vision and then he ended up growing a middle school ministry that had more than 900 kids at events right so we were literally running six or seven hundred kids every single Wednesday night and it was absolutely crazy in fact I used to lead worship for that JV ministry and we would get done and I'm telling you worship would just be kids 
bouncing all over this warehouse that we had that we turned into a youth ministry facility. And we would get done with worship and kids would start chanting, one more song, one more song, right? And it's like this crazy ocean of people, all right? And you're just like, these are middle school kids. Like this is sixth, seventh, and eighth grade kids who are so hungry for God that they're chanting one more song, right? But the way that he got there is because he started with the leaders, he invested into them, and his growth strategy always became get the leaders, get the leaders, get the leaders. As he invested into their lives, they were able to turn around and invest into the kids and that middle school ministry scaled to the moon. So I wanna encourage you, whatever it is that feels impossible to you, take a look and ask yourself, what would it look like if this was possible? So maybe you think, man, we just don't have the money or the resources or the people in order to grow past 200. But just ask yourself, what would this look like if it was possible? I love asking the question, what would this look like if we were cheating? Right? So if you're asking yourself, okay, like, sure, we don't have that, but what would it look like if we were cheating? Well, if we were cheating, we would just get some business guy to pay for everything. Okay, is that an option? I don't know. Well, if we were cheating, we would just have Chick-fil-A hand out invites to all of our men's meeting so we could get more men there, which we actually did that, by the way. What does this look like if you were cheating? Is there somebody in your church who has a specific skill that you can tap into in order to be able to reach more people, right? But just ask yourself, don't have a bias towards what's possible. Ask yourself, is this possible? What would it look like if we were cheating? All right, so I've got a free gift for you. Go over to churchgrowthagency.com or you can simply click on the link in the description below and I've got a video over there that's gonna walk you through some more church growth strategies that you can use in order to attract new visitors on Sunday and smash through the 200 barrier. We'll see you soon.